Mitch McConnell, a name that many of you will know, majority leader in the Senate, now for many years, senior senator from Kentucky. Uh, clever, ruthless, able uh, lawmaker, has shepherded many good and bad bills through Congress, uh, was the brunt of humor by, by comedians over the years that he was a turtle, the talking terrapin, he had his curmudgeonly lack of smile, his permanent frown, his marbles and mouth voice. But through all of that parody and lacerating humor, he was still majority leader. One of the fourth, fourth or fifth ranking person in the federal government. And the most talented legislator probably of his era. Or at least one of them, one of the two or three. Mitch... McConnell. Why am I talking about him today? Well, you know, I'm going to seem like an enemy of Senator McConnell when my, these remarks are complete. But it wouldn't be a natural uh, inimical feeling. I was a Republican really all of my life, and I'm still registered in that party. I must say, in the last 10 or 15 years, I've had deep misgivings about the principles and the actions and the, and the inconsistencies and the errors and the problems of that party. And it's true that in my later years of middle age and beyond, I've become liberalized, mostly and almost completely because of attempting to apply Christianity to my politics. That subject for another day. I'm sure Mitch McConnell thinks that in some way he applies Christianity, which he must participate at least nominally in, in, in his own politics, although I haven't heard him say that very often. What's he going to be remembered for? What's he going to be remembered for? For uh, passing the tax bill for President Trump? Um, no for other related bills, his attack on the, on the uh, Affordable Care Act, which failed, no. No, those will be forgotten. Why will he be remembered? What will be the first line in his short biography in the encyclopedia? It'll say, majority leader. It'll say, the years of his service in the Senate, which will end up being 35. Or, it'll say represented Kentucky. But then it will say, what? Well, let me go back a minute. He could have avoided this if he'd have been conscious and had any memory of his own youth and of his own hometown and the world he grew up in but he seems to have forgotten that. He wasn't born in Kentucky. He was born in Alabama, in one of the northernmost counties of Alabama, Colbert County. Legendary place, Muscle Shoals Studio is there. Legendary also for its incredibly violent and bad treatment of blacks during the era, uh, during the fight over segregation from 1955 to the Voting Rights Act, 1965. Now, I was just a kid at that time. And far away from the South, there were, of course, racial problems in the North that were enormous, too. I'm not making that point. There was racism in culture, and it's part of, our, it's part of the American tradition. But he was born in the belly of the beast, not in Kentucky, not in Pennsylvania, Alabama. And he saw in his 20s, not me, not my situation, 10 years old, eight years old, remembering these events. No, he was in his 20s. He was an adult. He'd been into college. He'd already started into his neophyte political career. He was moving into law school when these great events were happening. 
And he must have remembered that Colbert County was famous for having sent the Grand Wizard of the KKK to the United States Senate about a generation before his time. And he must have remembered that when he was a child, 30% of the people roughly in his county were black and the rest white. And that 30% comprised 90% of the people that lived below the poverty line. And he must have remembered that until 1965, there was a 12 year battle to keep those black citizens off the voting rolls. He was there, he must remember that. It was the most single activity of that political period. He must have known that he must have known that his county, Colbert County, and his city, Sheffield, were among the worst places in the South. He must have grown up with that. And anybody would become sensitive about that. And I don't even think that I'm accusing him of, of, of rank, hideous racism. I'm not aware that he has such an attitude. But what will he be remembered for? Even in light of growing up where he grew up, knowing what he knew, seeing what he saw, in the county where Aretha Franklin first recorded her music and the Staples sisters, and years later, out of a tribute to those great soul acts, the Rolling Stones made one of their most famous albums in that same studio. That was the world. You know what, what the Staples singers were paid to do their album? A 20th of what Elvis would have been paid or what Pat Boone would have been paid. That was the world in which he grew up. Well, what will he be remembered for? It's shocking that what he'll be remembered for is that when Barack Obama was elected president and helped to solve a problem, which was the parent and grandparent issue, moral crisis of this country, all the way back to the 17th century, long before the revolution, during it and after it, to the Civil War, to Reconstruction, down to the Civil Rights era, almost 300 years of conflict. What he'll be remembered for is that he said on the first day that Obama became president and represented a moment of almost total victory over our own past, the limitations of a nation by electing, a, by a kind of miracle, a social miracle, a black man to be president in this country with its history. He'll be remembered for saying on the first day of that administration, I am going to spend all of my time and all of my effort to destroy whatever he sets out to do. I will be his enemy from the very first day. I will try to stop all of his legislation. I will impede all of his programs. We will have a merciless campaign against the new president. That's what he said. I'm paraphrasing, but it's, that's the zone. Everyone knows it. Everyone remembers it. That'll be the first line in the encyclopedia that he said that when, when Barack Obama became president. And the second line will be that when he went out as president after eight years, he held his candidate for the Supreme Court hostage for a year against all constitutional norms and claimed that it had been done once before in American history. Of course, he didn't mention that it was wrong at the first time it was done. So he came in persecuting and prosecuting the new president, the first black man to ever hold that sacred office. And he went out denying him the right, the constitutional privilege of picking his own Supreme Court justice. He held that in his pocket for a year. Those two things will be in the first two sentences of his biography from now till the end of time and nothing else he did will be, will be significant. And it's because he forgot about Sheffield and Muscle Shoals and Colbert County in 1955 and he was old enough to remember. <laughs>